Bibles, I want you to turn to Romans chapter 3. And uh, if you've been walking with us over the past few weeks, you know, we're going through, uh, you know, the book of Romans, which is probably the most dense of, of all the books in the Bible. It's thick and it's deeper and there's a lot of layers. And um, as Paul starts out the the book, he, he kind of, the first three chapters are on... Um, why we would need a savior in other words the sinfulness of mankind and this is kind of the last really big kind of sermon on uh, on sin and the power of sin and um you got to remember that the context for uh the, the context for this book is uh the gospel had gone out and a bunch of jews and gentiles had had gotten saved and so Remember, the Hebrews were the ones that knew the Old Testament law. They had the Ten Commandments. They had all this information, and they were saved. But there was still a sense in which they felt like they were kind of insiders. They kind of knew this religious thing. And they're, they're sitting in, 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 the, uh, in the seats. And then you had all these Gentiles that, hey, when in Rome, they did as the Romans did, right? They were hedonists. They were living la vida loca and um, feeling great about that. And then all of a sudden, they hear the story of Jesus and they're like, wait, maybe my life is not about myself. And they were saved. And all of a sudden now they're in, um, they're sitting and, and Paul is trying to write a letter that would speak to both the Jew and the Gentile because there's some rivalries now, right? The Jews sometimes thought that they were the first, second, and third row Christians, right? And then the, you know, the Gentiles who got saved were supposed to be the back row Christians. And he didn't want that. And so part of kind of unpacking this doctrine of sin um, Paul needed to address right that rivalry that is going on because sin is big, and that's what we're going to read here. It's 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 really big. Uh, I like to make it not as big. I like to just you know think that oh really I you know I went uh, playing softball with the team. I'm thinking man, it's sinful for someone in a slow pitch softball game to go 0 for three with three weak popouts, and that's what I did on Wednesday. I mean that's sin. That's, I mean, that's kind of the depths of my sinfulness there, right? Uh, yeah, and, or, you know, it would be sin for Florida State to lose to Louisville, and thankfully they didn't. But, you know, you have the, we have these kind of trite views of sin, and Paul says, no, no, look, it, it's big, and, and it's bad, and um, we're going to kind of unpack this, because starting next week, we're going to see uh, the beauty of, um, of salvation. So, here we go. Romans uh, chapter 3, and we're going to read, it's, a, it's kind of an extended passage this week, but I want to read these 20 verses, and, um, and then we'll walk through it. What advantage then, remember Paul's writing, Jews and Gentiles, is there in being a Jew? Or what value is there in circumcision? Much in every way, first of all, the Jews have been entrusted with the very words of God. What if some were unfaithful? Will their unfaithfulness nullify God's faithfulness? Not at all. Let God be true and every human being a liar, as it is written, so that you may be proved right when you speak and prevail when you judge. But if our unrighteousness brings out God's righteousness more clearly, what shall we say? That God is unjust in bringing his wrath on us? Parenthetically, I am just using a human argument. Certainly not. If that were so, how could God judge the world? Some might argue, if my falsehood enhances God's truthfulness and so increase his glory, why am I still condemned as a sinner? And they're saying, here, he's just saying, well, if my sin, if I sin and it gets to show God's grace, maybe I can just go on sinning. It's not that big a deal. If every time I sin, it maximizes God's glory and his grace, maybe sin isn't such a big deal and no, that's, that's not it at all. Why not say, as some slanderously claim, that we say, let us do evil that good may result. Their condemnation is just. And so he kind of and there's a number of different arguments in those first eight verses that we're not going to deal with completely. We'll actually touch on them later on in this series. But this is kind of the meat and potatoes of what I want to talk about this morning. What shall we conclude then? Do we have any advantage... Do the Jews have any advantage? Not at all. For we have already made the charge that Jews and Gentiles alike are all under the power of sin. As it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands God. 
There is no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They have together become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. And this is a vivid description. This is how bad. So, and this is taken from uh, the book of Psalms. Their, their throats are open graves. Their tongues practice deceit. The poison of vipers is on their lips. Their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Ruin and misery mark their ways. And the way of peace they do not know. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world held accountable to God. Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by the works of the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of our sin. That's a, that's a heavy passage, one of the heavier passages in this book. And it kind of cuts us all um, at, at, at certain levels. It should cut us all. Um, but what we see here is Paul is reiterating his point like he made in Romans 1, where he said, if you're the hedonist partier, Romans 1, and he lists all these types of sin, um, you are saved by grace. And then he says in Romans 2, and think of it in terms of the prodigal son story. If you're the prodigal and you went off and maybe you're living that, you are still forgiven. And if you are the elder brother that stayed home and did all the right things, you're just as sinful and you still need grace, right? There, there, there's a sense in which, hey, we are all, Paul is trying to say here, we are all completely sinful. Sinful. The word here um, at the end, it says the whole world is accountable to God. The whole, that, that's a judicial term, right? That means you're liable. You're liable for punishment. And so he is saying, no matter who you are, no matter what your record, no matter whether you've lived this life of compassion and service or a life of cruelty and exploitation, you, right, we are all alike. We are all condemned. It was a hard week for us as a nation, wasn't it not? For us to see this hearing. To, to, for, for those of you that didn't, you know, the hearing of uh, Judge Kavanaugh. And I'm, I'm not here to make a political statement at all. I'm here to just say, I wish before those hearings began that this would have been written or this would have been read and said, hey, look, let's just make a blanket baseline statement about every human heart in this room. Here's what Paul says, right? Here's what the apostle Paul says about every single person in this room. Before we're thinking, right? We are all sinful. Every single Republican in that room was ridiculous, is ridiculously sinful. Every single Democrat in that room was ridiculously sinful. And let's just make sure that that is first and foremost. We are all sinners. Every single pastor is a dirty, rotten sinner, right? Every single pope that has ever lived is a dirty, rotten sinner. Every single bishop that's ever lived is a dirty, rotten sinner. We are all the same. And Paul is saying, look, do you have a light version of sin? Or do you have a deep, dark, in, in a lot of ways, dark view of sin? Because when you have a big uh, doctrine of sin, what do we know? Every person is equally sinful. Do you believe that? Because you know what? You could find yourself watching from whatever, other, or what, whatever angle you come from. Hey, I'm better than these people on that side of, of the room. And if you're over here, I could totally see where you're saying, you know what? Those people think that. <laughs> you know what de facto that means? I am better than them i am not as sinful because if you believe that then you have to be much more sinful than me and therefore i sit on the first three rows and you sit in the back row of the church right and this begins to creep in and it was happening in the church right the churched the churchy people yeah you're baptized you're circumcised you you're baptized as an infant and raised at west town church you always went to everything that we have what this is saying this is hard we're all the same no one's better Wait, you, you're telling me that if I got baptized here at West Town, I was raised, I always went to youth group, I didn't do all those things that I see everybody else doing, right? I, I mean, I, I, didn't have, I didn't have sex before I got married. I never drank. I did all these things. You are just as sinful as everybody. Yes. 
This is stunning. Remember Paul. Who is Paul? Paul is the Harvard grad, the Apostle Paul. He is, he is the Harvard grad that had the best professor at Harvard, Gamaliel. He knew everything about the law. And what is he doing? He's like, I was way up here. I never, these blue collar Gentiles, dirty, gross. I would never talk to them. And you know what the gospel did? It revealed how sinful I am. Therefore, hey, what, you know what? Um, we are all the same. He knows that in this room, some of us think this. Um, spirituality works like this. Um, I, uh, there's some kind of life that is considered a good life. Right? The evangelical Christian life. And I must adopt it. Right? And there is a kind of life that is bad life, and I must reject that. And that if I adopt a good life and reject and abandon the bad life, then what? Then God will do this, and God will do that. And so we view it that way. And ultimately, what, he, what Paul's saying here is everybody, spiritually speaking, is in the exact same place. So if you think what it means to be a Christian is, maybe you think this, there are certain things I have to stop doing as a Christian, and there are certain things I need to start doing, then God will bless me. I mean, that might as well be karma. You know, that might as well be, hey, you know, I just, I just believe in the law of attraction. You've heard that a lot, right? It'll attract good things. No. Paul is saying, no. Do you know how big a doctrine um, Christianity is? Um, because it's so much bigger because people who live good lives and people who live bad lives, you know what he's saying, are all alike. Do you believe that you're better than anybody else? Because you know, if you have a big doctrine of sin, you know how this will change your life? You know how this will change my life? Everybody's human that you inter interact with. It rehumanizes every single person. So you're the same. So you walk into any room and you are the same. You are not ever any better. And you know what? No one is any better than you, right? If you walk into a church and maybe you feel intimidated because of something maybe that's going on in your life, the, the truth is you should never, ever see people up here. Paul's saying, hey, I live that. You know what? You can leverage that. And as a, as a pastor, sometimes you can have, you can have over influence because people think you're up here and you're not right? No one, every, everybody is the same. And so what this doctrine of sin did to Paul is it rehumanized everybody. Do you need that? Or are, those, are there some people, are there some political groups that you think you're better than, or maybe you think you're worse than? Paul says, no, if we have a big T, right? The doctrine in, in, in our reformed circles, there's a five points of John Calvinism, five points of Calvinism. The T in tulip means total depravity. And that's what Paul is talking about. Everybody is totally depraved. If everybody is that way, then you know what? Everybody's human, and we're all the same. And you, um, you then can have a heart for them. You are not better. You know, There are no freaks over there, and we're the ones that got it together. Or you are not a freak, and some, no one has it together. You know? that, and that's, that's the thing is you get to know people. We're all, you know? we're all kind of wheeling dervishes. I mean, you really get to know somebody and ask them about their inner life and what's going on, you'll find a pocket of chaos somewhere in their life. And you think, wow, they look like this. When I see them on Sunday, they drive in in that great car. They look, you see a house? I mean, it's designer. And their family looks, no. We are all disrupted. We all need a Savior. And Paul's saying, let's just cut, let's just cut to the chase here. We're all the same. Every person is equally sinful. Do you believe it? You believe that's true. Second thing I want us to look at. How do you deal with, then, sin? I mean, how do we really need to look at sin? Because what are the verbs that Paul, uh, you know, what are the verbs that Paul uses here? He says, um, he says, turn away. All, he says, all have turned away. He says, there's no one that seeks God. Why would Paul use those verbs? Turning away and talking about sin? Uh, seeking instead of sinning? I thought sin was this. Hey, there's ten commandments. Do them. Or don't do that. I mean, seeking and turning away? Like, what, what, what is sin? Because many of us think, hey, it's a scoreboard. Look at the scoreboard. If you're doing well, if you're not sinning, you got a low score. If you're, um, if you're sinning, or no, flip-flop that. <laughs> if you sin a lot, 
you're, you know, you're really bad. If, if you don't sin very much, then you got a great score. It's a matter of what you're doing. And here's what Paul is saying. Um, sin has, that, that is not even a component that should be thought about because ultimately sin is what? Sin is, or, it's gonna come. Come, I, boom. No, not yet. Next, there it is. <laughs> that was weird. Have you ever thought, because this is the way Paul, sin is simply relational. In other words, sin makes you want to get out from under the gaze of God. That's sin. Anything that you do that makes you want to get away from God. And so he lists out, here are the Ten Commandments. Because if you do these things, or don't do these things, you know what it's going to do? You're going to want to get away from God. Because the point is intimacy with God. All right? And when you adhere and you see the law, right? That is a healthy way to view your relationship. Maybe some of you in here have a particularly deep relationship with your mom, right? Or maybe with your dad. Think of it in terms of that. What is it like to be with a parent that you have a great relationship with sitting in a car going on a trip? What is it like to sit there and to be able to turn the radio station, allow them to have their radio station, to talk about what's ever on your mind, to laugh at certain things, to reveal certain things, because there is a bond, there is an intimacy, right? And what Paul is saying is, when you sin, here's what happens. You hurt that relationship. When you know you've betrayed somebody, what is it like to sit in a car with them? When they know you've betrayed them, and you know you've betrayed them. There is this you know, tension that's right there. And Paul is saying, that's what sin is. When, when, if you could see sin as relational, not as, hey, here is a, you know, here's a spreadsheet, and you did well or you did poorly. No. It's all about, is there a connection with you and God? And what God wants is, to, is for you to value that more than anything. That's what Paul is trying to say. The most important thing is your relationship with God. And sin is anything that if you walk in here and you don't feel like you could ever sit on the front row or you have to be in the back row with your head down, no. I mean, why do you, I mean, if you sin, that's what it will cause you to do. Feel unnecessary condemnation, right? It, it makes you not want to be with God or flip it. It makes you feel like you're better than you are. It makes you feel like when you're in a car with God, you're bigger than he is. And you're going to tell God which way to turn. No, take a left here, God. You're going to take a right here. No, that's what sin does. It, you're not in right relationship with God. It's all relational. And so, when you begin to see um, that no one seeks blessing from God, why would Paul say that? Because if we're all honest with ourselves, you know, I want what I want. You know, notice that it, the text here does not say no one um, seeks blessing from God because we all seek blessing from God. Notice it doesn't say uh, no one seeks forgiveness from God. Of course you want forgiveness if you feel guilt. God is asking the question. Paul is asking the question of me. But Frank, do you want God? I know you want his forgiveness sometimes and I know you want his blessing sometimes, but do you want God? Because what does it feel like to be in relationship with someone that just wants someone for your money. Right? What's that like? Oh yeah, I know why they're here. I know why they're calling. They're selling me something, right? That's the first. Oh, they're selling me something. I can tell by the tone of their voice. They're selling me something. God knows it. Oh, you're coming to him for, you need this. You're, you don't have a job, right? You got this hurting marriage. You're coming to him, not for him, but for help with marriage or help for money or whatever. He's like, no, no, can you see sin as anything that takes you away from your intimacy with him, wanting him for him. How are you doing in that? And so he unpacks this and he says, no, look, the trajectory of sin, sin is relational. Nobody is really seeking God. I told you the story about um, last week, uh, or just about uh, dealing with alcoholics. There's, uh, as I was thinking about this, there's another story of a guy that I was seeing and he was talking about um, how he and food had this relationship. And I've talked about my relationship with food. But how he realized he was, I mean, a serious, serious overeater. 
and he would binge, right? And, um, and we kind of were talking through that, and he realized, that's where I go. When I feel pain, I eat, right? So I just eat, and he would mask, you know, he'd kind of go into one drive through sit there, get one meal, and then he would wait a second, eat that in the parking lot, and go to these, you know, other drive throughs and he hit three or four meals when he would feel pain, and that's the way he dealt with it. And he got bigger and bigger and bigger. Now, here's the thing. His wife, right, thought that it was her responsibility to deal with this. And she saw herself as the caretaker of a guy who literally overeats to deal with his pain. And so the wife was dealing with that. But as he began to deal with it, you know what? He stopped overeating as much and began to lose serious amounts of weight. And I remember him coming to me and he said, my marriage, I thought this would be great, but my marriage is hurting and I've lost all this weight. And it was ultimately the wife came in because she didn't know her place. You know, she saw herself as I'm the caretaker of a fat husband oh, yeah <laughs> that sounded funny to me but i'm just saying sometimes i feel that's lose job sometimes but um you know like i'm the caretaker of this of this guy right? like that's what i that's what i do right but ultimately what we realized is that no no now you know that's the role you've played but maybe you've replaced that with care just loving him right not dealing with the weight because the weight's become just deal with him it's not about your role. It's now. It's about that relationship between the two of you. Do you love him for him? Do I love God for God? Not because God's going to do necessarily bless me in the way I want to be blessed. And so Paul is trying to say to us, to the church at Rome, hey, um, how, 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 are you, how are you going to see me? Do you want to be close with me, God says? Do you feel comfortable sitting in a car going on a road trip? What's the tension? See it that way. Guard your life. Guard your relationship and your intimacy with all you can so we can be right. That's the way, church, I need you to view sin. All right. So if everybody's spiritually sinful the same and all sin is relational and it's kind of got this, um, yeah, this, this big relationship, how do you cure it? I mean, what in this passage shows us what the cure is? I mean, how do we solve this problem, right? Because... I mean, if you actually looked at the description here, the throats are open to graves, their tongues practice deceit, the poison of vipers on their lips. It sounds like zombies here. I mean, it's, I mean, literally, he's describing sinners that are like zombies. And I mean, that's, that's what it's like to, to enter into a life of sin. And so Paul says, okay, if, look, if you want to deal with us, if you really, really want to deal with it, he says, look, the first thing he says, is every mouth must be what? If you look at verse 19, it says, Now that we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be what? Silenced. If you want to begin to see this cure, Paul says, Are you okay with being quiet? Are you okay with being quiet? Because you know what? He says, ultimately, you'll never be able to receive salvation if or unless, and this is, you know, kind of, uh, you shut up, Frank. If you, if you would just shut up spiritually, if you just stop talking, if your mouth would be silenced, then you know what? You're getting there. You're, you're where you should be. And what does that mean, right? What does it mean to shut up spiritually? It sounds weird, but yes, what does it mean? It means no excuses. Stop giving the excuses when you come on Sunday. God, I know I did this. I know I clicked on the computer and I looked at this that I shouldn't have looked at, but... This is, this is it. This is that. And Paul says, no. As long as you think that you can come in here and just say that, and you give an excuse, or you come in here and you say, hey, God, I messed up, but just wait, give me this week. And so many of us come in here, and we say, God, I messed up here, but I know I can do it. And you leave and you say, I'll talk to you next Sunday, and I'll tell you how I'm doing. He says, stop. He says, just says, stop. Can you close your mouths for a second, right? So you can be quiet. Why? Because when you begin to talk, when you begin to make excuses, it's just another effort to what? Self-justify, to be self-sufficient, to, to self-save yourself. You're just making it worse. And he says, look, um, I need you to be quiet and what? And to know that God is in control. To know that, hey, look, um, it is God who is the one that does the saving, Right? It's, it's the one, it's, it's, it's the thing that God comes to seek and to save the lost. Because what this scripture says is you don't ever and you have never by yourself sought the Lord. 
Do you believe that? I mean, that's a big doctrine of sin. It means that you have really never sought God. That's what Paul is saying. You may think you have, but you really haven't. Because no one wants God. No one in this room, in and of themselves, wants God. No one seeks Him at all. You, you want other things. And so he says, um, it's all God. So you need to be quiet. Second thing he says to do is to fear Him. Right? If you would fear God, um, then you would be in a better place. Psalms or Proverbs says this, wisdom means until you fear God, you can't even think straight about reality. Proverbs 1, 7 says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. If West Town, if Frank, if whoever would learn to be quiet, to shut your mouth and be in the presence of God who loves you and to fear him. Now, when we look at fear, you know, many of us think, okay, I'm just going to be scared. In the, in the New Testament, there is one version, transliteration, that's it's from the uh, Greek word phobeomai, which we get the term phobia, right? That's not, that's not what this is talking about. Because remember, in Deuteronomy 10, here's what God says. What does God ask of you? That you fear the Lord, but to fear the Lord your God, love him. Serve him with all your heart. To fear God is to love him with all your heart and soul. And then Psalm 119 says this, because you fulfill your promise to me, I fear you. Because you've been so good to me, I'm filled with fear. Last text, Psalm 130 says this. Because you have forgiven me, therefore I fear you. Whatever the Lord, um, whatever the, wherever the fear of the Lord is, um, you are going to see an increased experience of God's grace and his goodness and his love. It, it's, going to, it's going to grow. And so it turns you, being fearful of God in a, in a joyful, humble, reverent way, and silent, what does that do? It just turns you toward him. Because so much of my life, I feel like, is turned towards myself. And I'm just thinking about what's in my best interest. Right? The sin inside of me says, think, Frank, think for yourself first. What's best for you? That's the sin inside of me. And, and, and the cure for that, right, is this spiritual silence and um, spiritual healthy fear of God because salvation is God seeking you and finding you, not you finding him. Um, and when you understand that, uh, it will be so beautiful. You will understand how much God has sought you your entire life. Let me give you the last illustration for this. If you've never read the book of Hosea, I encourage you to read it. And we've gone through it before. But there's no better passage of God seeking someone and saving someone than uh, the book of Hosea. And if you've never read it, it's essentially centered around a prostitute named Gomer. And Gomer um, is living life for herself. And God says to Hosea, West Town Church needs to learn a lesson. They need to know how much I love them, right? And so he says, Hosea, you're going to go marry the prostitute who's been with all these different men. And Hosea marries her. And you know what she does? She is the bride that never seeks the husband. In fact, she turns the other way, just as is described in Romans 3. And she leaves the husband. She is seeking some other lover, right? And we see all through the book, she leaves, leaves the marriage and goes and sleeps with somebody else. And God says, they don't understand. So Hosea, I know she just committed adultery. Let me tell the church, Westtown, how much I seek and save them. It's like this. Go back and get her. You go. I know she's cheated on you. You go back and get her. Because you know what? Every time that, you're, that she is unfaithful to you, you're going to be faithful to her. That is how much I love you. You don't seek and seek to enter into a relationship with God. You and I are the what? We're the gomers that went and we wanted to do things our way. And God, right, represented by Hosea, is the one that said, no, no, you can't out-cheat me. You can sleep with however many. I will keep coming for you you will never i will never divorce you ever you can cheat on me with however many people i know your sin is gross my love for you is greater and you know what it changed it changed people and the people of israel began to see hey look you know what i am that i don't seek after god but he seeks after me and when i realize that love when you realize that you've been sought after and you didn't seek after him and he kept finding you because you know what you've done to serve yourself. You know those places, that, those addictions that you've run to because you want to serve yourself? God says, you cannot 
without sin me. I will seek and save you no matter what. And that is the gospel, right? That's a picture of the gospel. When you and I have a big doctrine of sin, you know what we need? We need a huge cross. Because if we have a small doctrine of sin, we don't need a very big Jesus, right? We don't think a whole lot needs to be done to forgive us. But when you understand what Paul is trying to say is, it's huge. You could follow the rabbit hole, if you will, and your sin would be endless. But that's how big my grace is for you. Now, what if we lived like that? What if we lived in that truth? How would our marriages be? And that, I mean, that was fundamental to us. We protect our relationship with God and how we're doing with God. Man, out of that flows being a wonderful wife or a wonderful husband or a great father or a great son or a great friend or a great worker. What if we lived out of that? And Paul is saying, if churchy and non-churchy people come together and the gospel is the same for everybody, I mean, we can be unified and all lived and there will be no tribes in this, in this group. There will be no tribes in our church. There will be no cliques or people looking at someone funny. We're all the same. We all need a huge Jesus. What would a church in the Old Testament, what would a solid Israel look like? That's what I think as a church for us. What if we allowed this, this letter to form us? And our small groups are together. We're more vulnerable because no one's more sinful than you. No, one, no one's better than you in your small group right now, right? You're not better than anybody else in a men's group that you're in right now or a life group that you're in right now, right? You're not better than anybody else and no one is better than you. And so if that's the same, how freeing is that? I think it's marvelously freeing and that's what he's trying to do. Jews, Gentiles, don't, don't hate on each other because everything's the same. You need the same Jesus. Westtown. Hey, look, we're all the same. It doesn't matter if you live in, you know, West Chase or if you live in the slums somewhere in Tampa underneath, you know, I-70 to the overpass at I-75 or I-275. It doesn't matter, you know. We'll sit at the soup kitchen together or we'll sit at Ruth Chris together or Burns together. We're all the same. Everybody can sit at everyone's table because we're equally as sinful and we equally need as much grace. How could this change your life? If God brought you here on this Sunday to hear this message, how can you apply this this afternoon? How can you apply this at school on Monday or at work on Monday? How, how, how do we make this thing sing? Let's pray right now and ask God to uh, do his thing.